Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be looking at things you might not know about the Vatican. That's right, Vatican City is the most unique country in the world, and we're going to share interesting facts and history about the Vatican City that you've never heard. A sovereign nation, one built on intrigue, that spurns the curiosity of so many people around the world, the eternal city, at the heartbeat of it, Vatican City. Yeah, let's jump in, boys. I know I've been there a few times and uh, seen a lot of crazy stuff, but I haven't seen it all, that's for sure. Yeah, and it's like the same thing for me. I've, I've had the privilege as a missionary of mercy to go to different places within Vatican City. Um, I've been you know, with friends that work in the Vatican. So I've seen different p places and then also just the Sistine Chapel and like the, the Vatican itself, St. Peter's Basilica. And, and there's so many intriguing corners and the more that I continue to immerse myself in the mystery, the more it continues to enrich that sense of curiosity. And I want to know more. I want to go deeper. I want to kind of continue to explore the church at its at its heart. Yeah, this is going to be a real fun episode. Uh, Vatican City, like I said, it's the most unique country in the world. Yeah. I mean, one of the obvious facts, you know, is that it's the smallest country in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's about a half a kilometer. You know, that's... I That's mean, I, I know people who will have properties bigger than that. Yeah. And this is his own country and probably one of the most important countries in the world as far as diplomacy goes. Um, but I think the first fact that we can get right into and jump right in is what is it even called? What's the official name mm. of, you know, this place that we're talking about? What do you guys think it is? The Holy See? The Vatican? City? You're State. both kind of right. Both kind of The Holy wrong. Roman Empire? <laughs> See? So, the Vatican. So there's the Holy See. There's the Vatican City. There's the Vatican. Yeah. They're all different, distinct things. They don't actually all refer to the same thing. So the Holy See, which a lot of people say, oh, that's the actual name. Because that's what And it's not Holy See, S-E-A, like in water. Right. It's Holy S-E-E from say this, yeah. which means seat. That's right. A holy seat. Mm. So that's the how they're represented in, like, if you were to see them at the uh, United Nations, they'll say the Holy See. Yeah. But that's not the same thing as Vatican City. The Holy See is the administrative body of the Catholic Church. So that is the, like the government. That's like the ecclesial government. Mm. Now, the actual temporal government or the government of the nation is called Vatican City. Ah. So there is there there's a distinction. So in a between. way, we are both correct yes. and both incorrect at the same time. The Vatican City, the Holy See operates out of Vatican City. Yes. So they're not the same thing. So uh -huh. I didn't actually know the distinction before. No, I and I think that's an important distinction to to realize too, and and how the church interacts with the world yep. in the form of diplomacy, as you were mentioning, and and then how the church operates in her administration um, within is really important too. So let's talk about where the name the Vatican even comes from. Okay? Ah, I like so it. where the Vatican Vatican City is built on top of. Vatican Hill, yeah. right? Which is, you know, everyone always says, well, it's Rome, the city of seven hills. This was not one of the seven hills of Rome. This was at the other side of the Tiber. That's why when they say, like, you're converting, you're swimming the Tiber. Yeah. So this and what I love about it, too, is, like, it's the Paganos, man. I mean, like, this is, like, pagan origins. This is people on the outside. This was, this was like, the second suburb. Yeah. Right? I mean, this was the outside ring of Rome. Because you, when you think of where ancient Rome is and, like, where the Colosseum is yep. and the Forum and, you know, the, the, uh, the expression of Vittorio Emanuele, like, the, that, that, uh, that yep. birthday cake in Rome, all of that, you know, centered in the center of Rome, that is was where it is. So when you when you're there and you walk to where the Vatican is, that's a significant walk. I mean, it's a long walk to get yeah. there. I mean, it's it's outside of what is traditionally or was considered yeah. Rome at Rome's founding. So Vatican Hill was not part of Rome, but the name Vatican comes from a pagan goddess, an Etruscan mm -hmm. goddess, not even a Roman goddess, um, named Vaticanus. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Vaticanus was the goddess of childbirth, and her name originated because in, in ancient, archaic Latin, you didn't say Vatican. The Vs were Ws, right? So it had been Vatican. Yeah. So the name, yeah. 
So the yeah. name would have well, came I've from, seen like on all the walls, you know, the V. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. name would have came from the sound that babies make when their first sound, when they start mm -hmm. crying. So wah, wah, wadakin, wadakanus. That's where it came from. So it comes from originally the sound of a baby's cry is where ah. the name Vatican comes from, according to some, you know, entomologies. Yeah. That's weird. Isn't it? Mind blowing. I would say so. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Man, do we have some mind blowing? I got some ears. I got a Del Cross can't here. even handle it right now. So I if you're not watching it. on YouTube and you're listening <laughs> in, he's like his hands are grip gripping his head. Like what? This is mind blowing material on the Vatican. Yes, now everyone's gonna say, "Oh yeah, obviously the Vatican's built on a pagan goddess site." But yes, I mean, what, what do you want? I mean, that's just how history happens. I mean, oh absolutely, you know, the, the Vatican Hill existed a long time before you know the church. And, and the beauty of the Church of Rome and the Roman martyrs and the history of the first first three to four centuries of the church uh, with the establishment of the church being built upon Peter literally and his blood and his offering, you know, being crucified upside down in this pagan territory, you know, the, the reality of how the church interacted with pagan practices is that it utilized evangelization tools and skills to build upon the culture of where they were interacting. So the Jesuits learned that from the apostolic church. Mm -hmm. And it's important to realize that St. Peter, St. Paul, and the apostolic college went out to all nations and proclaiming the gospel and elevating people's minds, hearts, and souls from the culture of what they were exposed to, to a greater revelation. Now, here's another fun fact. The Vatican City has the world's highest population of consumers of alcohol. I am not shocked by that. The and it's not because highest... Tetlow lives there. Well, oh, it's, oh, it's because Lord. of mass. It's because of mass. <laughs> they consume more wine than any nation mm. in the world per capita. Mm. <laughs> wow. Look at that. Now, uh, there's a lot of per things. Capita. Per capita. Per <laughs> capita. That's, be, that's again, because of mass, Exactly. Right? Yeah. But there's a lot of statistical anomalies. Like, <laughs> they have the highest pope per square mile. Of anyone in the world, <laughs> um, they have the highest crime rate in the world mm. because I mean, there's only 450 citizens, but there's thousands of crimes every year. So the highest per capita crime rate. Mm. Um, lots of things. They've got the highest um, crime rate that happens not by her subjects, but by inside the inside, inside the, the confines borders, right. of the board. And most of it's like pickpockets, yeah, for sure, jaywalking. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, things like that. Yeah. yeah. And they probably have the most uh, religious stores per capita. Do you know there's not a ton of religious stores in Vatican City? There's a few, but just outside. That's all you need. <laughs> it's per capita, bro. I don't know, it's man. That's all you need. There's a <laughs> they have more museum space per capita. That's uh, probably true. I bet. I bet you that's true. Yeah, I bet, yeah. The Vatican Museum no is massive. No they doubt. probably have the most, the highest cassock per square mile rate. <laughs> <you know? Yes. laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of things that yeah. they have, but like a lot of statistical <laughs> anomalies because of just the size of the yeah. country. Um, we could have a sacred, whole show on that. Sacred space, you know, per capita. capita. Yeah. Linguini. Without a doubt. Linguini. Probably, per capita. Boom. They probably have the most per capita records per capita. Strozzo <laughs> <laughs> Fretti, huh? Per capita, huh? Yes. All right. Let's get on to some other interesting things here. Come uh, on, there's guys. some interesting we stuff that's shot. coming up that, uh, yeah. that we have some personal friends had a firsthand experience of what is accessible in the Vatican. So um, the Vatican, uh, we got a cool video for this. I'm mm -hmm. going to share this, and we'll put this up here on the screen for everyone to see. But the Vatican was built, because again, Vatican was built outside of Rome. So this is like, you know, a lot of sports stadiums, are, they're not like, they're in Foxborough, or they're in Richfield. They're not in Cleveland or Boston. They're in Orchard Park, not Or like Philly, Park. like outside of the city, like right. on the way, yeah. So the Vatican was home to a racetrack. The Va I mean, Vatican City was built. On top of a race, it's like way across Georgia. <laughs> way across <laughs> Georgia. <laughs> so here's this really cool video that I found that kind of shows a historical recreation of Rome, the Vatican. Oh, nice! This is created. It's really cool. As so if you're existed. listening in right now, you definitely want to connect on YouTube. And when you do, make sure that you hit that like, that thumbs up, and subscribe, sharing our content because this is a really interesting thing right here. The Vatican from the perspective of 2,000 years ago. Yeah, so you can see here on the on the bottom left, you can see the Tiber, and you can see up here, and I'll, I'll play this here, you can see... Um, 
All the tombs. Yeah, you can see the tombs. That's the Necropolis Street. That's the street in the Necropolis. So they would, that's where you'd have tombs. And then there's the racetrack. And you can see right there the obelisk, right in the middle of the racetrack, that still exists in St. Peter's Square to this day. Um, but then when they were doing the persecutions, they were having executions inside this racetrack. And right there at that obelisk is where Peter was crucified. And now this is the first rendering of St. Peter's Basilica. Right. And uh, this is a gorgeous cruciform parish with the Romanesque architecture and the facade, mm -hmm. courtyarding in the in the middle, and then the steps and the cascading steps that go bell up. Bell tower, yeah, the bell tower is beautiful. Is it still there? That bell tower. They have they have this rendering uh, beautifully in in um, the access point to go underneath the Vatican and to address the necropolis, like yep. you were showing. You can actually walk underneath St. Peter's Basilica and the excavations that were done in the 20th century and uh, and see firsthand that kind of roadway um, and to to the to the location where his remains are. Me, I think it's what's interesting about this is they're it's called they're the building Tour. they're they're building this church literally in in the ruin. In yeah, in the yeah. ruin of well, that. in the in the ancient world, they never removed what was below it. They would just fill it on top it of it because yeah. they didn't have like, you know Dump Back trucks and, and dump yeah. trucks. They would just infill it with dirt. Yeah. So and, here, and it's really cool because even Rome is like that. You can go underneath and mm -hmm. excavate. And mm -hmm. that's how they can yeah. typically tell where something is from based yeah. on the layers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, cool. I actually rewound it a little bit here. So you can see how now this is, you know, where the circus had kind of fallen into disrepair. But you can see the small little white building to the top, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the original shrine of St. Peter, mm -hmm. right? These were all necropolis. It was a graveyard. And you can see they just basically dragged his body a couple hundred yards and plunked him in there. Well, mm -hmm. he's in the tomb with all the other tombs. Right, so but that this, would make this sense. white one right here, right? that was the original St. Peter's. And that structure is still mm -hmm. exists directly below mm -hmm. the art of the mm -hmm. um, altar. It looks the familiar now. And, and uh, you have accessibility to it through the Clementine Chapel, which mm -hmm. is just a beautiful, intimate uh, chapel. Awesome. And you could see some of the pieces of this shrine that you have here, mm -hmm. uh, this in the necropolis. And, and the neat thing too, is like, as you, as you approach his resting place, you see all of these Christian graffitis and of of the Catholics of of the first several centuries burying their loved ones mm -hmm. close as close as they can to St. Peter. Yeah, and this building right here had the inscription Petros Eni. Mm -hmm. Peter is here. So then I'll, I'll hit play again and show the progression. So now you can see that they built Constantine built this big basilica, and that little smaller mausoleum is now encompassed within there. And you can see how it's built right on top of the yeah uh, on top of the ruins of that mm -hmm. track, right? And then as time progresses, you can see that's what we kind of look like today, right? Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the one before, and then yeah. and then where's the obelisk here? So they moved the obelisk. Okay. Now they moved the obelisk from where it used to be in the center. In the center. And they moved it over to here. But there's still a small building over here, which is the it shows the site of the original. Execution. I remember, yeah. I remember seeing that. It's and like a little cupola. Yeah, yeah. And if you just if you kind of connect, uh, if you're following the left hand side of um, the columns, the columns here, and you go all the way back to where the transept on on the left of the of St. Peter's Basilica, it's in between there and the yep. columns. Yeah, right before you go on that tour to go see his bones. Yep, but it's pretty cool just to see how that the city built up over top yeah. of it. So, you know, from the first century. To oh, this is cool how they did the progression. I yeah. love this video. Yeah, isn't this real? I mean. What a good find. Uh, that's really neat. Yep. So, very cool, you know. And I'm proud <laughs> to be a Catholic. Well, it's interesting that you say that you start singing something like yeah. that. Yeah. And you're being all patriotic. Yeah, man. Right. And when are we typically patriotic? July 4th, right? Mm-hmm. What, you know what the Vatican's? July 4th is for them? When would that be? What's May? their independence it's in day? in May, right? Nope. February 11th is mm. their independence day. February 11th, 1929 is when mm. the Vatican City was founded in the Lateran Treaty. Excellent. So February 11th, which is the feast of Our Lady of um, Lords, what? you know? What is, uh, the, what is the interest of the church in becoming a state in that regard? Well, th that happened. That was called the Roman question, okay? Because... The, the Pope had controlled almost all of Italy for a thousand years or longer. 
But then, you know, after the Enlightenment, after the invasion of Napoleon, there became a nationalist unification movement. That's why you have the tricolore flag of, mm -hmm. of Italy. And they made it one country under, under the king, right? But what do you do about the Pope, right? The Pope still kind of controlled Rome. And the Pope's like, we're not giving this up. So there's a big standoff because the Pope could just say, hey, everyone in this country is Catholic, and if you mess with me, I'm just going to tell them to, you know, can't support this person anymore. So they had a standoff. So that was a big political question forever and ever because the Pope cannot be subject to a government. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't say, well, the, the prime minister of this country can control the Pope and the Pope is a citizen of some other country. That's, that's not good for the ecclesial government of, of the church. I mean, that's what we had during like the, the reign of the Byzantine emperors, right? Where the Pope, it was like Kaiseropapism, where the emperor had to ratify the pope. That's that's bad for the faith. So they eventually came to this agreement where, okay, we're taking the rest of Rome, right? You're going to get to keep this little a tiny amount of land, but it's completely independent and you are not the subject of any king or government. And that's really what it's for so that they can maintain their own independence. Mm. Excellent. So it only went on for a thousand years, and then yeah, it was just years. I'm still I'm still looking for the restoration of the papal states. I think it's time. <laughs> uh, it's only been like a hundred. You are a patriot, years. my friend. You are a patriot. <laughs> <laughs> and you know why? You know how I know I'm a patriot because I have this song playing in my heart. <laughs> you know what the song is? <laughs> this is the national anthem of the Vatican. Let's play it. Did you? Yeah. So the national anthem of the Vatican is called the Hymnus Modus Militarius Pontificalis. Of course, mm. it's in Latin. Of, well, of course, that's that official language, and that's uh, known as the Papal March. So this is, you know, when we're wearing our Vatican shorts and setting <laughs> off, setting off fireworks and eating pasta, you know, Bungle? on February 11th. On February 11th for the Vatican uh, Independence Day, this is what we're going to. We're all going to stand at attention. So the lyrics basically are, O oh, Rome immortal of martyrs and saints, O oh, immortal Rome, accept our praises. Glory in the heavens to God our Lord and peace to men who love Christ. To you we come angelic pastor, in you we see the gentle redeemer, the holy heir of the true and holy faith, comfort and refuge of those who believe and fight. Force and terror will not prevail, but truth and love will reign. Hail, hail, Rome, eternal homeland of memories. Your glory sing, a thousand palms and a thousand altars. Rome of the apostles, mother, guide of the redeemed. Rome, the light of the people, the world hopes for you. Hail, hail, Rome, your light does not go down. Hatred and shame overcomes the splendor of your beauty. Rome of the apostles, guiding mothers of the redeemed. Rome, light of the people, the world hopes for you. That's beautiful. When was that written? Um, This was... In 1869, by Charles Gnude for the celebration uh, for Pope Pius IX's Golden Jubilee. Hmm, I love this. Yeah, aren't you feeling patriotic? I love it, man. So, who's the head of state? Is it the Pope himself? You know, so that's actually so. Vatican City has the rarest form of government in the entire world because it does have its own government. Per capita. No, not even per I'm capita. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the Vatican is, and it's probably the rarest form of government in the history of the world, an absolute elective monarchy. That mm -hmm. is the official form of government. So they most of the time the when you have an absolute monarchy, it's hereditary. It's like, okay, well, this king dies and mm -hmm. then his son becomes the king. This is really one of the few examples in the history of the world where the king or the monarch is elected and has absolute power, but it's not a hereditary position. Hmm. But, I mean, the pope is the absolute end-all, be-all of all power. Supreme power, yeah. yeah. If he wants green beans for dinner, <laughs> he gets green beans. He gets green beans. And I, yeah. From what I hear about Pope Francis... He doesn't eat My guy food. loves green beans. <laughs> <laughs> eat your fruit. Actually, he, I hear actually he just eats chicken and vegetables for like mm. every meal. Mm. <laughs> inside scoop. That's an inside scoop. So if you ever have the Pope over, just make a, you know, a sensible chicken dinner. <laughs> um, but there's two people who pretty much help the Pope. Because the Pope's not like signing the payroll, right? Mm. The Pope's not like writing off the, you know, traffic tickets. 
I mean, he's meeting been, with landscape artists. He's not meeting with landscape artists. It's called landscape architects. Architects. <laughs> he's probably not doing that. Yeah, but so, I'm doing that. I just <laughs> did that. So there's two people who help the Pope in particular with that. So one is the Cardinal Secretary of State. That is basically the Prime Minister of the Vatican. That's mm -hmm. the person who, look. He's got absolute power when the Pope is not absolute powering. No, he's the one who's making all the connections with other governments. So look, if, oh. if someone from the United States wants to call the Vatican, they, they call the Secretary of State, hmm. right? And what you're, what you're talking about is like the sedes vacante when, when the seat is vacant and you know they need to enter into the electoral process. That's when the tribunal of the Holy Father remains operative in his name to exercise the roles and the responsibilities. That of, would be the Camerlengo. Mm -hmm. So you have the Secretary of State who runs the Holy, I'm sorry, Vatican cities, the Holy Sees relationships, but then you have the Cardinal Vicar because the Pope, you know, I mean, Bishop, he's the Bishop of Rome, right? Now, I mean, I know your Bishop is actually hands-on dealing with the matters of his diocese, mm -hmm. right? The Pope is not handling the day-to-day -day operations of the Diocese of Rome. I mean, I know he's the Bishop of Rome, so traditionally it's the Cardinal Vicar who is the de facto and functioning Bishop of Rome. He's the one who's kind of running, if Rome wasn't the seat of the Popes, he would be the one doing the, you know, the Bishop type things there. Mm -hmm. He's kind of like the rector. A, a little bit. He's, he's, he's the Tetlow. <laughs> he's the Tetlow. Which is also the reason that the uh, <laughs> per capita wine. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of our boy, Father Tetlow, and his appreciation for wine. <laughs> he doesn't um, drink a lot, but he drinks good wine. He, he, has, good, he has good taste. Yeah. He has good taste. And he's got good friends that, uh, that, that help him along the way. But, you know, the, the sense of wine and the quality of wine, you know, I, I remember going to Cana and I was so excited to, to go to the place where Jesus transformed water into wine. And then when I tasted the wine of Cana, it was the most disgusting <laughs> you wine I've ever had. You wanted to change it back to water. I know. Yeah. I'm like, please, you know, please. Well, yeah, they're like, oh, well, you saved the good wine. Well, that's probably not that hard of a thing to do after drinking Cana wine. <laughs> There's an easy audience. <laughs> but what people may not know, like per capita, yeah, like the producers of wine, the Vatican is like number one in the world. But traditionally speaking, like the wine in the Vatican historically was the worst wine <laughs> because that region where it was outside of the city, the, the marshy areas and the water there was not a great source to be able to, you know, produce high like, quality wine. So I don't like think Father Tetlow would have been happy. <laughs> yeah, mad dog. So this is before the church. This yes, is like this is before times. the church, before yeah. the church. And in fact, they would, they would say That's that, crazy. you know, if you drink the Vatican wine, you're drinking venom, you know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> is that a kind of bibis bibis? <laughs> How far Venuna. back does that go? Like, is it like, they're still producing wine right now? Well, they don't now, produce right? wine. No, this, like he's saying like, like Julius Caesar times. Oh, okay. Right? I remember reading, so there was the year of the four emperors, 69 mm. AD, mm. and there's four emperors. They were all fighting all kinds of civil wars. And I, I, I can't remember which one. I think it was maybe Maxentius or one of the one of the ones. He was the third of the fourth emperors. And he marched his troops, and he was about to march onto Rome to establish him as the emperor going forward. And they're setting up camp on the Vatican. Mm. And then all of his troops are drinking the water, and they're all getting dysentery and mm. pooping their brains out <laughs> and getting sick and dying. Oh, and no. they're drinking the water from the Vatican and ended up getting so smoked from it that they lost the war. <laughs> and that's the reason oh that we had it was the year of the four emperors instead of the year of the three emperors. Wow, man. And Mexico comes to mind. And and it's it's a very similar uh, like marshy yep. low yeah yeah very similar. Uh, you ever get any bad uh, topography? Bad juju in uh, Mexico? No, I, you know when we got back from that Fatima trip, I got sick, but I think it was a virus that I had. It wasn't uh, from Fatima or Mexico. I'm sorry, Mexico. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. I brought bad. home. I brought home. Um, I think we all did. We all got sick. Well, I brought home COVID as a souvenir from Mexico. Wow. Yeah, and I just think I think a lot of it's just it's travel. Airports, yeah. Travel's yeah. like the thing that. Well, that I think I got you. it in Chicago actually. Really? Because I spent a long lay over there, packed shoulder to shoulder. Wow. Mm. No, the blessing. Like I've I've been to. Um, I've been to Mexico a number of times and to Mexico City and, and some of the border towns and stuff. And, and um, 
the, like, I, thank God, like I haven't, I have never been sick. The food has been absolutely delicious. And, you know, from the group that we traveled with it's on great. pilgrimage, like everybody was blown away how excellent and high quality the food was, but you also don't want to go to some street taco place mm-hmm. where maybe the meat that they're using has been like sitting out for a long time. You know, yeah, we passed by some people that were literally like out in the middle of the street. Yeah. And they're just like, yep. On some like, in the middle of highways, like where there's like 10 lanes of, you know. Well, that was our favorite. That was my favorite place to eat in Mexico, was that place in the under the overpass. That is the best spot. Those street tacos. Oh my gosh. So, anyway, real quick, a really funny quote. There's a first century Roman poet, Marshall. And he wrote that <laughs> there was a practice of kind of stretching your wine, right? So you'd get your really good Falernian wine, mm. right? That was your expensive stuff. But when you have guests over, you don't want them drinking all your good booze and pouring it on the table <laughs> 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 with wasabi peas, right? You don't want them to do that. So you set out the less good stuff, right? That's because exactly what Ryan Delacroix or, or, <laughs> or you mix it, right? Or you take, That's why he brought the Boone's Farm out. Right, take, ah, I'm getting You it take now. your good booze, you mix it with your bad booze, and then you have a decent booze, and that's what you give to your yeah. guests. And this poet You're wrote, welcome, Ryan. <laughs> now, this poet wrote, your guest, your dinner guests might deserve it, but such a good wine as Florian wine did not deserve to die by being mixed with Vatican wine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so your guests deserve it, but that's the excellent. wine didn't deserve it. That's excellent. So remember that next time Delacrosse is drinking all your uh, Woodford. <laughs> <laughs> now these, now these are these are uh, fascinating facts about the Vatican and the history of the Vatican and the production of wine. You know, now in in that Roman territory, if you ever get a chance to go on pilgrimage to Rome, make sure you go to Frascati and have their wine and enjoy yeah. the beautiful mountainous region just outside of the city. And there is some quality vintages uh, that I've been introduced to over the years. And even just being in the eternal city and enjoying the beautiful sights and and, and sacred spaces and stopping in at a cafe and having even you know, prepared wine by the by the owner of that restaurant, and it's like house wine, but it's the most delicious stuff that you could ever yeah, enjoy. Awesome. So, big shout out to our winemakers in Rome today. You've kind of turned the you've turned the you well, know Rome the corner was fine, here. Just the Vatican, Rome is fine. the Vatican yeah. stuff. Eh? The food in Rome is fantastic. But you know, talking about fascinating things that are in the Vatican that people may not know. So, a couple of our friends, Father Mike Nixon and Father Tim Holita, I think Father Kevin McEwen was with them as well. Uh, they kind of kind of went into an area of the Vatican that they did not have uh, access to, and and they shouldn't have gone. Were they still seminarians? They were. I believe they may have been like transitional deacons or right. you know young like in the seminary for sure. And uh, but they they make their way through this area, and they're just like they're bolting, and they're like trying to like see as much stuff as they can, and and they you know they're kind of caught. So Did then they pull Timmy, up the stanza and poop in the post per- per- personal and, and, bathroom? And this, is all, this, is all, <laughs> this is all from memory. But then, like, Tim sees an ATM. So he just, like, runs up to the ATM, and he's, like, you know, trying to like put in his car. Something. Like, he's trying to do something. So they're all gathered around the ATM. <laughs> and then the Swiss guard comes over, and they're like, Come on, let's go. He's like, no, I'm just trying to get, you know, just to get some money. <laughs> you know, Tim, you know Tim, Timmy. Yeah. So, but something that he said was, like, you know, he went up to it, and all everything on the screen was in Latin. The the ATM. I've been to a Latin ATM in so cool. the Vatican. I, so cool. I, I was just like, this is neat, right? I have no idea what's How going on. How much money did you transfer to someone else? <laughs> 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 oh my gosh! Uh, so the, the ATMs are in Latin. There mm-hmm. there are ATMs in the Vatican. And you can't translate it to English either. <laughs> it's just in Latin. <laughs> really? Yeah, mine was. Okay, well that's yeah. gonna make some traditional sappy. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, I don't agree ATM. with Pope Francis, but when I go there, I sure do love the ATM. <laughs> and, and the unfortunate thing is a lot of those trad- traditionalists will never be able to figure out how to get money because they don't know how to read Latin, right? <laughs> I can't imagine trying to get money out. And imagine trying to do a conversion of dollars to euros in Latin. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, I mean, I'm like, like, cool, and I get my money out. I took out like three mm, bucks. You know, yeah. so stupid. That's so funny. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, so you you've both been there, and you know the big walls they got. Going oh yeah, city, right? it's so impressive. The walls of the Vatican are amazing, and how high they are, and seeing them from a distance, you know, and coming through residential areas, and then you come up to the wall. It's a very striking and moving. Yeah. Defensive, uh, and that's their that's their border too, yeah. right? And then that, mm-hmm. that wall, like that's where it ends. Exactly, yeah. exactly. 
Yeah, th- those are called the Leonine Walls. And you're right, that does make up the border of Vatican City, the actual political entity, for the most part. There's mm-hmm. some areas where they're a little bit different. But those walls go back to 852. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the that's the only time that this is after the rise of Islam. And that's the only time that Muslim pirates made it all the way to Rome and sacked St. Peter's because you had the Aurelian walls, which was the walls that went around the city of Rome. Mm-hmm. And you could defend those. But like we said, Vatican City is outside of the Roman traditional walls, yeah. of, of the Roman walls. So they didn't have any walls. That's why St. Peter's in this area got its own little set of walls. And that's why it kind of developed as a very separate district. You had Rome proper, then you had the Vatican inside these own these own specific Leonine walls. So it goes back, their border, although set by the Lateran Treaty of 1929, goes back all the way to um, the, the Pope, had Pope Leo IV, building these walls in protection against Muslim pirates. Mm. You know what uh, protects you from pirates? <laughs> a sword? Not only a wall, but prayer. It does. Prayer protects you from the piracy <laughs> of demonic activity in your life. And Tell me more, my lady. Uh, if you want to know more how to protect yourself I, from I do, ye pirates, I think you need to pray more. With the peg leg. When you pray, listen, <laughs> one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is pirates <laughs> to be fortified. The fortification of fortitude, right? To be fortified and walled up spiritually. Fortitude strength. Fortitude is strength. Fortitude. And you need to have strong <laughs> borders <laughs> in your life. And I know one app that can fortify your prayer life? Pirate Battles Online. Not that one, but that sounds pretty interesting and fun. I bet you Howard plays that. He's a nerd like that. He's probably playing it right now over there. Howard, get off of Pirates Online. And pull down your eye patch. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but that is the number one Catholic app in the App Store, and that is Hollow. That's right. Hollow is a fantastic app. Yes. And I know Hollow loves our advertisements for them because they're so professional and polished. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow, you can try out the world's number one Catholic prayer app absolutely free. And this app has so many amazing features. Rosary and um, Divine Mercy Chaplet and all sorts of... Like uh, Tio Dubina. Novena. A lot of children's stuff now. Yeah, it has... Good music. They have journaling features too, which is pretty cool. Prayer groups. Yeah, prayer groups. Prayer groups. I'm in a prayer group. They have Mm -hmm. stuff It's called Mama's Boys. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. That was my football team at Ave Maria. Yeah, you've said that every time I say this. <laughs> really? Yeah, we, <laughs> we do these terrible. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you we pirate need, slayer. <laughs> we need to light the Father Mike Schmidt's candle so you up your game. I know. Uh, but Father Mike Schmidt's, he's on there. Yeah. They have Bible on the Year on there. They have um, uh, Mark, Wahlberg, Mark Wahlberg, Jonathan says, Rumi, Bishop Barron. Mark Wahlberg's just a very magnanimous guy who wants, wants to know how everyone's mom's <laughs> I'm never going to communicate that to my mother. <laughs> And thank goodness she doesn't watch the show. <laughs> she doesn't watch your own show. <laughs> She's like, oh, Richie, I Sorry, love your Mom. show. It's real nice. We're going to put it right up on the fridge here. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's got so many great things. I, over a billion prayers have been prayed through this app. I mean, they have sleep aids. They have the Bible. They have uh, reflections. They have things to prepare you for mass. They have novenas. They have books. Pretty much anything you can need. It's the, the you know, Catholic and we we thing. know a number of apps, and we use a number of apps. I know I do uh, on a daily basis, but it is the most robust Catholic app that provides more volume and content than any other app, and it continues to grow each and every month, hitting new levels of of success and efforts of prayer. Over a billion prayers prayed through this application, and it's really connecting people in Christendom and our Catholic faith in a beautiful way. Yeah, so again, go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow, H-A-L-L-O-W, to try it out now. Hollow.com. Pirateslayer.com. <laughs> so uh, two more facts, you know, that I think are absolutely about Rome, mm-hmm. about Vatican. So everyone thinks, okay, where does the Pope live? What's the Pope's church? It's St. Mm-hmm. Peter's. That's not actually true. And that's not where the Pope lived for almost all of history. For most of history... The Pope lived in St. John Lateran, Mm -hmm. not the Vatican, not St. Peter's, Mm -hmm. um, up until, so like from the time of Constantine, Constantine Constantine killed one of his enemies, married his enemy's sister, and then was inherited this property. 
I'm sorry, that's just how history works. Right? <laughs> like, you, you kill your enemy, marry a sister, now you got a big property. And then you're like, well, I don't want to keep this because, I mean, I, my uh, wife's kind of mad that I killed her brother, whatever. <laughs> I'm just going to give it to the Pope. It's off my hands. So that's how the, the Popes got their first center of operations, which is St. John Lateran, which comes from the Lateran family, which is, you know, Constantine was killing and marrying into. Anyway, the Lateran Palace. The Lateran Palace. So the popes lived there all the way up until 1300s uh, when they decided to cheese out and move over to Avignon, mm. right? And they were like, they're living yeah. in France. Oh, it was weird. So they lived, they were in, the popes were in Avignon for about 70 years, right? Until what, what was the Saint um, Catherine of Siena mm -hmm. told the pope? Confronted the pope. Oh, it wasn't Teresa. It was epic. It was, it was uh, Sia Catherine of Siena. Wow. Yeah, and she's like, you know, hey, pope. I'd go back to Rome. You're the bishop of Rome, but you live in mm -hmm. France, dude. Not not cool. He's like, yeah, I like the linguine better over here. Yeah, it's better wine. The better uh, wine, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no good. Come on, Catherine. Oh, no, leave me alone. Come on. What's a, what's a pope got to do to get a good glass of wine? Right? I got moved to Avignon. <laughs> well, you know, like, and, and France in that, in that period of time was just so generative in oh, yeah. respect to the reform of the church and liturgical reform and really the arts and the expression of the arts that came out of uh, liturgical practices was inspiring worldwide reach uh, from France. So the, the influences of France in this time of history was massive. They were the center of power in the world. Yeah. And basically the popes were almost kind of the puppets of the French king of the yeah. period. Yeah. But then Catherine of Siena, who's just, Totally tough, mm. awesome. Just says, I don't care about the king or the pope says, do what you got to do. I don't care if you don't like the wine. Go back. Yeah. So they go back to Rome, the pope, and the Vatican, I'm sorry, the Lateran Palace, is it's a wreck, dude. There's squatters. There is even rumors that wolves were just like digging up the catacombs and walking around with bones of saints <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because like, that's crazy. Like, My they, mouth they, is like they, wide open right they now. They like, completely what? abandoned it. Yeah, oh, Lord have you had, mercy. You had, the, I've never heard you had that the lupus, before. the lupus of Rome. You know, it was probably <laughs> Ramus and Remulus's like great aunts, no. right? Just chewing bones from the catacombs, walking around, right? Mm. So like, well, the Pope's like, like I got to live in this absolute. <laughs> Ramshackle Squaw. flop house in squalor with bad wine. I ain't doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm the Pope. I don't got to do it. <laughs> hey, you got any places over there? Hey, 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 so so like, like, you know, oh. I, but they got over in the suburbs. Oh, that's right. They got St. Peter's. You know what? I'm going to move over there. <laughs> so that's really how the Pope ended up living in St. Peter's instead of Lateran. But the Lateran is still the Pope's cathedral. Mm -hmm. So that's where the Pope's chair, the sede, is in St. John Lateran. Mm. But, you know, the wine and the digs are nicer at the Vatican, mm -hmm. so what, what can you do? But now St. John Lateran is basically the museum of the papal states. Mm -hmm. And and still highly uh, practiced in the, in the liturgical traditions of the Holy Father, uh, you know, presiding over important liturgies like Corpus Christi, for example, yep. and the traditions of procession with the Blessed Sacrament and adoration from... St. John Lateran to Santa Maria Maggiore. So, you know, there is still the function of the, the pastoral nature of the Pope um, in lit lit liturgical practice still from the heart of it's where it all began. The four churches, mm -hmm. or is it the four papal churches mm -hmm. of Rome? So that's St. Peter's, out, or St. Paul's outside the wall, St. Peter, St. Mary Major, mm -hmm. and St. John. Those mm -hmm. are the four papal basilica, yep, the major, ba Yeah, major, major basilicas. basilicas. Co-cathedrals. Is that what it's like? <laughs> I don't know. We have a co-cathedral in Houston. Yeah, Galveston. you do. Galveston. Yeah. Houston. Well, yeah. the, dude, the bishop of Galveston, he's just like, Galveston. Technically, you guys have like... And I'm going to Houston. I'm like, I can go to Bucks West after Mass, or I can cruise <laughs> up to Houston and get a good meal, right? <laughs> I've been to it's Galveston. Have options. <laughs> right? Bucks West. I'm the bishop of Galveston. Galveston, nice, nice sea. Oh, crap. Well, let's go to... Well, we're Galveston, Houston... Galveston, Houston, I don't know, somewhere else nice. Yeah. <laughs> At least they gave the primacy of that to, to Galveston, their, you know, the tradition. Well, and that's the history, yeah, the history of it. And, yeah. and really, that was, that city before, what was it, was the major hurricane in the 30s or something like yeah. that? Yeah, uh, early 1900s. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, it was one Wiped of the biggest out. cities in the, in the country yeah. at yeah. the time. Yeah. And yeah. then it makes a ton of sense that everybody moved Every, you know, yeah. everything moved north. So that's yeah, why people a, chose to live in Houston because the weather sucks there. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, it's a swamp. Well, now it is. But in, Gal it's, it's in like Galveston, Florida, it's, it's bad for three months. Out of it, the year. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's, it's nice for you know some of the year. That's and, what I mean. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah you wouldn't build a it's city a bayou. There unless you needed to. It's a bayou. We have levees and all yeah. that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. So the last last cool thing about Vatican City, Vatican City has its own sports leagues, right? They have their own sports franchises. That's so cool. Yeah. So I want a jersey. Is it basketball? It. Unfortunately, no. It's not baseball or football. Well, it's football, technically. It's European soccer. rules football. Okay. It's soccer. Yeah. They is it their, a private, private like intramural thing? No, it's it called like it's a, called the Vatican City. In something. The the Vatican City Championship League. And there's eight teams. And the official team of Vatican City is the uh FC Guardia. Wow. Well, they've 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 got more soccer teams per capita than Most, any country in the world. I no, no. Yeah, per capita. Per capita, yeah. I'm sure they do. Yeah, yeah. right. There's another. Because I mean, with with 450 people <clears throat> and eight teams, like yeah, like it's like you're either wearing a cassock or you're you're walking around <laughs> soccer trunks. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, look, only two things come from Vatican City, and I don't see you in a cassock. <laughs> <laughs> so can they participate in the World Cup? I don't think no. they're good enough. They probably could. Why Why would they not give, like, diplomatic rights to Catholics who are outstanding superstars in soccer? That would be cool. And then... They could and extend then that. really build up, like, to. a team to compete. Yeah. And... Wouldn't that I'd be cool? i watch soccer. Yeah. Yeah. I would watch that. Yeah. Look, if there Even was an official Vatican team... I'd be all right. If the Vatican, if the Vatican was in the Olympics... That would be awesome. Psh, yeah. Come on. That would be... We Bible. should do that, man. Yeah. The Vatican, yeah. <laughs> We'd have shark. those little vuvuzuelas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Patriotic song. Yeah, this is this is great. Yeah, but the, uh, the Vatican City's football team, FC Guardia. Yeah. I'll wear a hat. They've never won the championship in 100 years. Uh, so they're the Cleveland Browns of the Vatican East football we've team. We've got to change it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I've said this before in another episode when I was Pope Athanasius the Hammer. <laughs> I said, look, the first thing I would do, one of the things I'd do is make everybody a citizen. I'd make everyone a citizen. Mm-hmm. And I really, I still think, look, the Pope should just say, look, you can have dual citizenship in Vatican City and you know, just pay pay your due taxes, you know, 10 bucks, whatever it is, and then have some diplomatic protection as a Catholic. And then you can also support the Vatican, and you could play on its teams, right? I mean, Italy does that. I mean, like we could get, you know, if we show how somebody I am going came to do over that. Yeah, really from Italy, we can get visas mm-hmm. and whatever. Yeah, it was become a citizen. Yeah, we'll like or whatever you have, like the um, like the FIBA basketball. Like Kyrie Irving plays for Australia or whatever. Like, you know, you have people who play. I think we can have some pretty it's amazing, amazing teams, athletes, right? dude. Could you could you imagine what the Vatican do can do? Look, if you pulling get, like, from the talent of the world, yeah, you get, like Messi and, and Ronaldo, Jesus. and they are Catholic and Jesus. So you got Jesus on the team <laughs> and all these good it's guys. It's just like this right here, the statue that Tanisha gave us. Yeah, this is this is uh, the Vaticanese basketball team. Jesus, absolutely <laughs> just tumbling this poor kid. What <laughs> tumbling? <laughs> <laughs> this kid tries to get off a of shot, and Jesus is like, no. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Hail to the no, no. Hail to the no. Uh, yeah, so those are some interesting things about Vatican City. Like I said, Vatican City is super interesting. There's so much more so to much learn. More. But, I, you know, I would encourage all of us, that, you know, even though we're not official citizens on paper, I think we should all be official citizens in our heart, and we should learn more about it, and we should celebrate every year February, February 11th. 11th and we should have a big party. Patriotic song. Absolutely. Shooting off fireworks, eating pasta in our cassocks, wearing an <laughs> FC Guardia shirt, drinking terrible wine. Yeah. Uh, doing the racetrack. This is sounding like a party I want to be at. And I'm we, sure you want to be at it too. Can we make sure next year that we record on February 11th and we just have an online Vatican Let's City make it happen. Independence Day party? Hey, Siri, remind me on <laughs> February 11th to party. <laughs> Sorry, you already have three reminders to party on that day. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a party atmosphere every time here at the Catholic Talk Show. We have a lot of fun, and we're so happy that you connect with us each week to celebrate the joys of our faith and to share some intriguing materials just like this show. So if you're considering supporting our show, make sure you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. You'll see every way that you could support us financially, and we've got some amazing gear and some swag to send your way and say thank you. To all of our followers on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, we got a lot of love for you. Please share the love and share our content with your friends. And before you go, if you haven't hit the subscribe button, what are you waiting for? 
hit that subscribe button, click the bell. You don't want to miss material. We come out every week and some great shorts that we have on our YouTube channel. So make sure that you're connecting with us on your commute or at your leisure at home. God bless you and your families and all your friends. United in Christ, Catholic Talk Show. See you next week. Arr, matey. <laughs>